morning, everyone. We've been asked to ensure we start on time, and but we're going to give everybody just a minute to get settled, and uh, and then we'll get going right away. Okay, and the bright lights. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm um, really pleased to be kicking off this session and co-hosting it. Um, my name is Neil Neary, and uh, I've been a CON member since uh, 2009, I believe, and I'm a former boot camper, so I'm one of REA's uh, people that sticks up their hands when we ask about that. Um, and uh, our other co-host today is Dr. Leia Miniker, so we'll, uh, well, I Sorry, we'll do that. Okay, so my name is Leah Miniker, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. And today, we're going to be talking about food policy. Um, so I will introduce our first speaker. Kelly Moen is, um, so before we start the session, sorry, I'd like to invite one of the patient engagement committee members to share his personal perspectives of this topic. Mr. Kelly Moen is a former bariatric patient who has a keen desire to introduce and advocate for greater focus on mental and emotional well-being of bariatric patients. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Kelly Moen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what a pleasure to be here today, and <coughs> what a spread out crowd we have. Um, I'm going to uh, just give you a little bit about who I am, and now I do have slides. Is this what I use to cue them? I don't know. Do I push it? Wreck the whole thing? Uh, there we go. This is me, implicitly me. Um, before we start, how many of you have been to a con event before? And the rest of you, this is your first time? How many of you have ever met me before? Fantastic, all my tech friends back there. Uh, great, so um, implicitly me, uh, let's see. Implicitly is kind of like the bias that we, or the events that happen in our lives that are a little bit covert that we're not really paying attention to happen back in our subconscious whatnot. Um, and this is how I take my approach to finding out who I am and locate myself and studied very heavily um, in psychology, in the psychology of obesity, which I'll introduce to you in a minute. So uh, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, this is what I want you to take note of, is I am completely available to talk to you about any of my um, ideas and my biases and my excitedness and upsetness with policy. Um, Something about me is sometimes we need to laugh when it's uncomfortable, but laugh anyways. I hope that you can find out uh, a way to be authentic in this next 13 minutes that I have left. Um, there's no shameful questions at the end. If you have anything to ask me, you cannot shame me more than I've ever been shamed in my life before. And please just be who you are. And um, remember, we're all here to learn, and hopefully I can sway you from my perspective and not these guys. Um, so who am I? I currently live in Victoria, BC. I used to live in Alberta, but there was a little bit of a health crisis with the discrimination of obesity that I experienced. And I kind of hit a wall with uh, being able to function as a person. And I had gained um, through many uh, weightlifting accidents, um, a wheelbarrow accident landscaping, and um, having a very sedentary job working at a telco. I ended up gaining copious amounts of weights, losing copious amounts of weights, and ended up wrecking my homeostatic system and lost my 
uh, hunger and satiety signals. So there was never a stopping point when I was eating, and there was never a stopping point when I was working out and exercising. But I did live with chronic pain and was taking approximately 2,000 milligrams of Advil in the morning and then another 2,000 in the afternoon and another 2,000 to go to bed. Um, what I studied, because of this pain and this discrimination that I had felt growing up, I, I needed to go and figure out why the system wasn't able to help me, why the healthcare system didn't understand what I was trying to accomplish, why even the diet industry couldn't help me, and the fitness experts couldn't help me. So being kind of a take charge person, I just said, to hell with it, I'm going back to school. And we liquidated our entire assets and said we have this many months to make it, and we moved to Victoria. I was accepted into their psychology program where I spent three and a half years studying the psychology of obesity. The uh, framework that I used was the self-determination theory, which has three makeups of autonomy, competency, and relatedness. And my competency and relatedness were broken with my body, therefore I no longer had autonomy with who I was. I then applied self-regulation around food in our society and our social valuing process and how we interact and eat in a group or eat alone and how we can automatically overeat when we're not paying attention and how we can undereat when we're around strangers. So my hope today is that we can become friends because I do have a lot to say and I am within a dynamic organization of the Public Engagement Committee and our mandate is to reach out and create a vibrant community for people suffering from obesity. And for policymakers, you guys are the ones who inadvertently affect our environment. And if you don't understand where we're coming from or what our needs are, how are your policies going to affect me? When dealing with weight bias, we have an implicit association, which means we don't even know that we're doing it. This chair in front of you, if I was my 535 pound self, I would feel discriminated against because I couldn't fit and it would hurt my back. But it's just a chair. And it's a chair that is created for the normative 60% in the bell curve. I'm an outlier. Normally I'd ask you to stand up and do a bias test, but I think if you've read enough of the research on weight bias, we know that we're all weight bias. We all have it, including myself. So you have to wonder what my thoughts against myself are, which I'm constantly fighting with self-esteem. So I'm going to share a slide with you that I shared only once in Vancouver, but I feel brave enough to share it with you again. And it is my um, before picture. This is me when I'm 535 pounds and can barely walk and I'm using crutches. I had a weightlifting accident where I was on the inverted leg press pressing 1,100 pounds and I inadvertently crushed the disc between my L4 and L5. And I now have arthritis in my spine and have a false joint on the right side. So I'm constantly living in pain. The challenge is I only got that news and that result back one week ago because I was too large to fit into the CT scanner. And it took me five years to lose 178 pounds to fit into that CT scanner so that the medical community could help me. I would show up to get an x-ray and they would say, you're too big. We can't see inside you. How do you think that made me feel? So what do you think the largeness does to someone's career? What do you think that does to somebody's emotions? You start feeling very dislocated in society. You start feeling disconnected. You start feeling worthless and not of value. I was fortunate enough to have the great telco job. And in my telco job, a combined income of myself and my wife, we were able to achieve uh, a net income of $6,300. However, our two young children and my premature son and childcare and medical and mortgage and the insane winters Edmonton and Red Deer would get cost us dearly with hydro, or well, I guess you guys don't have hydro, with power and gas. <clears throat> and we really only had about $1,000 left over to buy shoes, clothes, and groceries. So I want to talk to you about how socioeconomics 
really affect obesity and perpetuate the stigma. And I hope that if I offend anybody here today, you will be strong enough to come to me or my friend Marty, who is our chair, Marty Wave. And uh, you don't need to go running and telling on me because I am 44 years old and if I do offend you, I'm sorry, but I really need the policymakers to understand, even with the soft science of psychology, what policy can do emotionally to someone if the policy isn't considered of their lifestyle and all of their conditions. So this is in the island of Vancouver, or sorry, <laughs> island of Victoria. Um, I went shopping at Thrifty's grocery store the other day, and there were four 454-gram uh, bags of old Dutch potato chips for $8. And there was a cup and a half, maybe two cups, of Greek salad for $10.95. The $10.95 uh, holds 495 calories, and the four bags of chips holds 9,323 calories. However, I'm a student finishing the last 12 months of my master's in counseling psychology, and I'm on a very limited budget. So what choices do you think I make when it comes to grocery shopping in my budget? Am I thinking about nutrition or am I thinking about cost? I'm thinking about cost, as much as I would like to think about nutrition. And having two sons age eight and age 13, when I do get the money to buy the nutritious food, it goes to them and not me. So my current socioeconomic condition is perpetuating the way that I'm allowed to interact with my food. This is going against my personal motivations of my intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. It is also going against my internal and external locus of control. And right now, policy controls my external locus of control as much as my economics do. This is where I need policymakers to consider not taxing sugary beverages and junk food, but taxing the corporations and funding and subsidizing whole foods and the farmers that grow my vegetables so that we can in turn create that Greek salad to be four or five dollars and the potato chips to be 20. Make the companies increase their price, don't charge me. Because if you charge me at the end with the taxes, that is another implicit bias and you're making obesity my fault, not the company's fault. And this is why with the next slide, it's the company's fault. Right now, I'm gonna share with you that I identify as Métis. I'm a fifth generational Cree Indian, and I'm also Scottish. And I identify more with my indigenous cousins than I do with my settler cousins. This is what my aunt, living up north in Lynn Lake, Manitoba, had to pay for milk. The lettuce was not far behind. And my Inuit cousins, who live up north, have to pay $109 for 12 bottles of Nestle water. We have food policy and addiction. The biopsychosocial aspect, these four bags of chips and how they're designed are gonna keep me coming back for more. So would you really prefer to tax me for a behavior that's being driven by a company? Or would you prefer to be implicitly discriminatory towards me? and then tax me and make me feel even less of a human because this is what I can afford. And the way that these junk foods are tailored with fat, salt, and sugar, my brain chemistry wants me to keep coming back for more. If you did write down my Facebook page, you can find the article with an 11 minute video or you can simply go to cbc.ca and look up food cravings engineered by industry. There are scientists that show you how they look to make the chicken McNugget to keep you coming back for more. That's not social responsibility. That's perpetuating obesity. These companies need to be held accountable and they need to be held accountable with your policies, not me. I need to be helped. That's the solution that I have for you today is to regulate the added sugar. We don't need it. Tax the corporations, not the buyer. Subsidize whole food growers offer incentives to the vegetable farmers to reduce the prices at the grocery store. There is no way that I can afford $10.95 to feed a family of four with only a cup and a half of Greek salad. That's not fair. So you are what you eat and this is me and I've been able to be empowered through my journey with Peck and Khan 
and going back to school to discover the psychology of obesity and working on my master's, and I'm now helping others discover who they are and move past the discrimination and the low self-esteem and teaching them how to be connected again with their homeostatic system through science. I run a bariatric support group at the Royal Jubilee Hospital. We have over 60 face-to-face -face members, and they are scared to approach you. They are scared to stand out because of the discrimination that they have felt. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, I got past all the shame and judgment because it just came to the point where I had to stop caring. I have to really stop caring what people think, and I have a cause, and I really hope today, with all the science that you guys are about to deliver, that you will listen to this wholeheartedly about how policy can perpetuate implicit discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kelly. Uh, fascinating work that the PEC is doing. So I'm very, so very, very happy to see all of that. Um, I realized that we had like one of the worst, or I had one of the worst cold opens to the session this morning ever. I think I told you my name, but I don't tell you what, didn't tell you what I do. But I am Dr. Neil Neary, um, and I am the program manager for stakeholder relations for a health and welfare trust in Alberta that serves about 130,000 Albertans. Um, so. What we'll do is we'll bring up the first speaker of the morning following that presentation from Kelly, and that is Manuel Arango. Uh, so the first speaker this morning is Manuel Arango. Dr. Arango is the Director of Health Policy and Advocacy for Canada for the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Arango. Uh, thank you very much, and great presentation by Kelly. Oops, I almost lost my voice. Uh, absolutely correct that policy can definitely have unintended consequences uh, on you know, weight bias, et cetera. Uh, at the foundation, we've been working on the issue of obesity for, since 2005. And I, and I can tell you that at the beginning when we started working on the issue, we definitely made some mistakes in the way we publicly addressed the issue. Uh, and so we've learned from that. Uh, still have a ways to go, but policy is a complicated thing. And I do agree with you, uh, we have to subsidize uh, healthy foods. That, that's really important. And we have, to, we have to actually go after the manufacturers and, and tax them. Um, and you'll hear a little bit that, about that in my presentation uh, today. So thanks for that. So thanks very much. So my talk is entitled um, Our 21st Century Diet of Convenience, and I will talk, uh, focus on marketing to kids restrictions and sugary drink policies, in particular a levy. So I have no disclosures. I, uh, I would, wouldn't mind consulting, making a little extra income, but I don't really have the time. Uh, so <laughs> no, no consulting fee disclosures. Uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation does receive uh, some support from certain uh, corporations. Uh, pharmaceutical sector, et cetera, but no conflict with the issue that I'm certainly addressing today. So just a quick overview of my presentation. I'll speak very briefly to nutrition trends, uh, address one of my favorite issues, pet peeve, a juice as a sugary drink, and then why we need sugary drink and marketing to kids uh, policies in Canada. So a little bit about the Heart and Stroke Foundation. We're one of the largest health charities in Canada. We have over a million donors, uh, hundreds of thousands of volunteers. Uh, we have very effective health promotion programs, and we've funded almost 1.5 billion in health research since our inception back in the 50s. So certainly, uh, state of nutrition is not ideal in Canada. Uh, unhealthy diets are certainly a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. It's very expensive, costs the health care system quite a bit of money, and fruit and vegetable consumption is really poor in Canada. Over 60% of Canadians have inadequate intake. Um, with respect to sugar, this is r data from a, a study from Mary LeBay from the University of Toronto just from last fall, and she found that 20% of calories in prepackaged foods are comprised of free sugars, and it's as high a whopping 70% when it comes to beverages. So, so uh, that, is, that is really unfortunate. 
and sugary drinks are certainly uh, the single largest contributor to sugar in the diet. This is data from an international agricultural organization, the FAO, and they have found that over the last 30 or so years, there's been significant increases in the industrialized world and in other parts of the world um, in terms of food consumption and energy availability. So we had a food insecurity problem, but we've kind of overshot that now. Um, this is uh, data as well from the World Health Organization, so building on the previous data I just spoke about, and they looked at fruit energy uh, supply and obesity over 30 years or 40 years or so uh, in middle, low income uh, and high income countries. And what they found was that in 81% of these countries, they saw an increase in food energy and obesity during that exact same time frame. So in high income countries, the industrialized countries were seen to be driving that association. Um, that report also looked at, um, and it concluded that the oversupply of calories, much of it from cheap, uh, widely advertised ultra-processed foods, were more than enough to explain the overall worldwide obesity epidemic. And they concluded that policy efforts should focus on this. Um, this is also a study, uh, a study from, uh, that was conducted in Spain, published in the American Journal of Nutrition, and it found that ultra-processed food consumption was in fact associated with a higher risk of overweight and obesity. And co cross-sectional studies also undertaken by the Pan American Health Organization in 12 countries have found the same type of link. Uh, and there's another study that was uh, also conducted in Brazil that found the same type of thing, association. And this is data from Jean-Claude Mouberic from the University of Laval. And he looked at household food expenditures and energy availability in Canada over several decades. And what they found was that household food expenditures for ultra-processed foods and ready-to-consume products increased significantly uh, over this time frame, uh, basically a doubling. And when you look at the energy availability data, you can see that ready-to-consume and ultra-processed food products, in fact, doubled over that time period. So this is Canadian data. Affordability is also an issue. So you can see there's been roughly a 75% increase in the price of 2% milk over this time period here, 95 to 2012. And whereas with the sugary drinks, um, it was only a 26% increase. US data, somewhat similar. Fruit and vegetable consumption, really high. Com and that's the top line compared to the inflation rate, which is the orange line. Um, and then you can see the line at the bottom, that's sugary drinks and sweets, um, much, much lower, very little increase. And, and so uh, the last issue that I'll talk about before we get to uh, sugary drink policies and marketing kids is the issue of, of fruit juice. Uh, and I wanted to refer to you uh, to a couple of studies, uh, one that was published about a decade ago, and looking at kids that were overweight at or risk for overweight. And they found in that study that there was increased fruit juice intake was associated with a excess adiposity. And whereas offering whole fruits was associated with the reduction in that adiposity. A couple of years ago, studying in pediatric obesity, uh, they found that drinking 100% fruit juice regularly aged H2 was associated with a higher uh, odds of becoming overweight between two and four years of age. So as a result of this data, key opinion leaders published an opinion editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics uh, just last, a couple of years ago, and they concluded, uh, made the recommendation that the U.S. government should not include fruit juice in, in uh, foods, the government food stamp voucher, vouchers program. One complicating thing for sure when looking at the issue of fruit juice is that the, it, it can be very compli complicated with the epidemiological data because unlike other sugary drinks, uh, fruit juice is perceived to be healthy and therefore people that health, have healthy, healthy lifestyles consume fruit juice. So it's very difficult to tease apart the impact of fruit juice as a result of that. Um, not the case with pop. Uh, the bottom line is though that sh fruit juice contains as much sugar or sometimes 33% more sugar than pop. And there's no scientific evidence, no physiological basis, no metabolic basis to indicate that the sugar and energy in 100% fruit juice is any different than the sugar and energy found in beverages and other sugary drinks when it comes to weight gain. 
And if you think about the process, how juice is manufactured, and, um, it is heated to eliminate bacteria, and that zaps out all the vitamins and minerals from the juice that's extracted from the fruits. Then it's refortified with the vitamins and minerals. So really, it's, it's sugar water that's fortified, and it's really not different than fortifying pop. And you just wonder, you know, why, w why wouldn't we fortify pop if we, we have juice? Of course, I'm not recommending that, but I'm just indicating that, you know, the situation's a little absurd. Um, it, it's really imperative for the Heart, uh, the Heart and Stroke Foundation believes, and many key experts believe, that it's important to remove the provision from Canada's Food Guide that makes fruit juice an equivalent to fruits. And uh, I hope Hassan will address that in his presentation next. Putting you on the spot, Hassan. <laughs> um, and, and just a few clips from Yanni Friedhoff's blog. Uh, you know, juice is not a fudging fruit, he says. He also says that juice is a gateway drug for soda. And very interesting, this is from last week, and this is a product produced by Oasis uh, Juice. And, and they, they put, have a claim on the front of their product that says, really close to fruit. Um, quite absurd. Uh, there is one jurisdiction that has actually been addressing the juice uh, uh, situation, and that's Amsterdam. They have banned uh, parents from putting juice uh, in, in their kids' lunch, lunches uh, that they bring to school. So they're only allowed to bring water or low-fat milk. Um, so kudos to Amsterdam for taking action in, in that respect. Uh, you often hear from the food industry, you know, restricting marketing to kids, addressing sugary drinks, a levy on sugary drinks, it's not a magic bullet. Um, and, it, it, and obesity is complicated. That's very true. Nutrition and obesity is, are very complicated. We need comprehensive approaches. But addressing marketing to kids and sugary drinks are key tools in the toolbox to address these issues. If you don't address those two issues, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle when it comes to um, a comprehensive approach. So the Heart and Stroke Foundation, uh, through its Children's Nutrition Campaign, has been focusing on the issue of sugary drinks and marketing to kids in, in a variety of ways, working with a couple of coalitions. Uh, and Tom Warshawski, who is here today, he is the co-chair of the Marketing to Kids Coalition and the Sugar, Sugary Drink Coalition. We've commissioned wor uh, research, undertaken advocacy, developed position statements, et cetera. And so, I just want to focus in very quickly on the issue of levy on sugary drinks, and I know that Jan Lobodo will be doing that as well. Um, we do know, as I mentioned, that 70% of the calories in prepackaged foods are made up of free sugars. Um, and uh, it's clearly, we know there are health risks associated with sugary drink consumption, including dental caries, and it, it, it spans a number of diseases. Uh, as a result of this, we commissioned a report through the University of Waterloo. It was led by Dr. David Hammond and his team. They looked at two things. What's the impact of sugary drinks on health, economics, if we don't do anything? And two, what happens if we implement a levy? What would happen over the course of 25 years? So this was an insert that was in your, um, in your conference bags. And, and it summarizes some of the data from this study. And it found that over 25 years, well, we, we could potentially, if we don't change things, um, expect 50 billion in healthcare-related costs as, as a result of continued increased sugary drink consumption and many, many thousands of deaths, as well as many cases of, um, of, of I, oh, overweight, obesity, diabetes, cancer, et cetera. They're all listed there. So the second part of the study looked at, okay, if we implemented a 25%, 20% federal excise levy, what would happen over 25 years? And it found over $11 billion in healthcare savings and a possibility of generating $43 billion in revenues, which could be used to support healthy living programs, uh, obesity treatment programs, et cetera. So it would, it, it's a great source of potential revenue. Uh, this study also looked at uh, this, the uh, trends in sales of certain sugary drinks, and we found that there's huge increases in certain types of sugary drinks. So energy drinks, sweetened coffees, flavored waters, and, f uh, and flavored yogurts really saw huge increases over uh, the time period from 2004 to 2015. 
And we know that sugary drinks are, are a real problem taking into account the food insecurity issues in some places. In indigenous communities, um, they have uh, poor access in some cases to, um, to safe drink, drinkable water. And so the only option for them for hydration is sugary drinks. So something we could really address and using revenues from a levy could be used to support this, these types of uh, problems. So we do know, and there's lots of evidence to indicate that price impacts behavior. It's a fundamental tenet of economic theory. It's worked with tobacco. It can work with sugary drinks. It's worked in Mexico, in fact. Uh, in Mexico, in the second year that the tax was implemented, they saw a 10% reduction in the sale of sugary drinks as a result of their 10% tax. Another example that I, use, I like to cite is Hungary. They had a, a two-tiered tax system where they had a higher tax level for uh, sugary drinks and uh, unhealthy foods. And what they found was that with this two-tiered tax approach, they had a, a companies um, in 40% of the cases refor reformulated their products to get to the lower tax level. So taxes can work and re investing that revenue is very, uh, a very smart thing to do. And when you tell the public that you will reinvest the revenue, you get very high levels of support for a levy, 70%. Um, so our, my last issue here is the issue of restricting marketing to kids. Um, just curious how much time, five minutes, great, excellent. Um, another really key issue which has a huge impact on behavior. Uh, we commissioned a report through the University of Ottawa, uh, Minik Pot Van Kent. Uh, she led this work. It was released in February. This report got um, 100 million media impressions, 380 news stories. Uh, were generated as a result of it. It was blogged by uh, several people like Marian Nessel, uh, Yanni Friedhoff, um, um, Jamie Oliver as well from the Uni United Kingdom. And it looked at the digital marketing environment in Canada. So we had some evidence and data on how kids were marketed to with respect to unhealthy foods and beverages on TV, but we didn't have it on, in the digital sphere. So this study looked at laptops and computers. And what it found was that Kids aged 2 to 11 are bombarded with basically 25 million ads on their top 10 favored websites every year in Canada. So just huge numbers. And no surprise, 90% of the food and beverages that were marketed were unhealthy. And we've seen the similar results on TV as well before. And as well, of those 25 million ads, 96% uh, were for um, uh, ultra-processed foods. So really a, a, a dire state when it comes to nutrition for our kids in Canada. And the, ch the, the industry does, has had a voluntary initiative to address this issue, but it really hasn't worked. It's been rather insufficient. We've seen increases in children's exposure to food and beverage advertising uh, actually since the implementation of that initiative. Uh, and, and Nick Pop Van Kent from Univer uh, University of Ottawa has done a lot of research in this respect. Uh, use of licensed cartoon characters has increased during that period. And, uh, and this initiative considers something like Lucky Charms to be a healthier for you product. So re really, you know, this underscores the need for regulation. Um, in Quebec, they have had an initiative to address marketing to kids. Uh, we believe it has been effective. There's been one study that came out about five years ago that found a 13% reduction in the likelihood of purchasing fast food in Quebec compared to other provinces in Canada. Um, Quebec also has the lowest childhood obesity rate among six to 11 year olds and the highest fruit and vegetable consumption rate in Canada. So we think we need to follow suit and I'll speak briefly about what, um, about a bill that is, taking, uh, that is uh, going through the Senate at the moment in a little bit. Just very quickly, some uh, public opinion research. Uh, we know that um, from January 2017, we looked at 2,400 uh, Canadians were polled, and we found support almost 80% for restricting marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages in Canada. And the very last, last stat at the very bottom here says that 71% of Canadians and parents believe that because the food industry spends so much money uh, to market to kids, it makes it very difficult to raise your kids and to uh, have a healthy food environment for them. So um, I think for many of you that are parents, you know that pester power is a huge issue. You're in the grocery store trying to shop and um, this marketing really influences kids and, and they work on their parents uh, as a result of that. 
So uh, as I mentioned, there is a bill that's going through the Senate right now. It's sponsored by Senator Nancy Green Rain from British Columbia. Um, that bill is going to be going to uh, the committee for hearings at the end of May and uh, many health organizations will be appearing as along with others to uh, testify. And, and it calls for an amendment to food, the Food and Drugs uh, Act to prohibit food and beverage marketing to kids aged 13 years and under. We think it should be increased to 16 years of age. Um, that's what was done in the United Kingdom and we think we should do the same type of thing. Uh, this is also part of Minister Phil Potts' mandate to address marketing to kids. And um, we, we do think, uh, as I mentioned, that the, the age should be increased to 16, and Dr. Tom Warshawski has done quite a bit of work uh, on this issue, and this is data, uh, some, some points that he has, has generated over time. And we do know that young kids, for sure, are definitely susceptible to marketing, um, and, but so are teenagers. The decision-making part of their brain is not as developed at, in the adolescence years compared to the reward center. So what we find is that the reward center usually overrides decision making amongst teenagers and making them um, susceptible to unhealthy impulses. And because they have more disposable income because of part-time work compared to kids, they have an ability to act on those unhealthy imp um, impulses. So as a result of that, we, we think that the age should be increased and we should afford kid adolescents the same protection that we do in other areas. Um, kids are not allowed to drive until uh, they're 16, 17 years of age. Age of sexual consent is, is higher, voting privileges, alcohol consumption, and tobacco consumption. It happens all at a later age. So we think the same thing should be done with marketing to kids' restrictions. So we are calling on senators to, um, to support Bill S S228, which is the bill that's led by uh, Senator Nancy Green Rain, with an amendment to increase the age restriction to 16 years of age. And so just to summarize and conclude, uh, clearly nutrition trends and changes in the last several decades can partly account for the obesity epidemic and nutrition policies and interventions that have a population level lens are, are really critical. Uh, critical. They're, they're not magic bullets, but they're part of a comprehensive approach to address nutrition and weight gain. And without them, it may, would make it very, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Manny, for that um, great presentation. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Hassan Hustrensen, who is the Director General of the Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion uh, within the Health Products and Food Branch of Health Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hutchinson. Thanks very much. Let's see if we've got the right, there we go. So um, I was just noticing that the discussion now is uh, up to date, at least in this session, has really talked about different sorts of policy approaches. In the next session, are, are a lot of you staying in through the next session as well? Because I'm going to talk more about a number of different initiatives, like the marketing to kids, like the labeling. Um, like uh, uh, a campaign that we're putting together with respect to sugar, sweet, and beverage reduction. I'll talk about that next time, like in an hour, whenever that is. Uh, and this one, we're going to talk really about the transformation of the food guide, just give you an update on that, okay? Just thinking either could really fit in quite nicely here at, uh, after this discussion. Um, so this is our disclosures, nothing to disclose here. Uh, and again, on this particular presentation, I'm going to bring you up a bit on what we did to really look at the evidence base with respect to dietary guidance, uh, let you know where we are with respect to the transformation, and then talk about what we're doing with respect to stakeholder engagement, since we have, we'll say, in, in the past perhaps been criticized with how we interact with different stakeholder groups. Uh, this is uh, our, our health eating strategy. I will talk about the health eating strategy in an hour's time. Uh, but just to let you know right now that we don't consider the food guide as sort of a standalone thing, what we've tried to do is to look at all the different initiatives that we do in, um, in Health Canada and also how we link with other parts of the government with respect to healthy eating and trying to plan it in a, in a sort of a coordinated fashion so that we're reinforcing each other so that the messages are the same, that we're using really all the different types of levers that we have in, in government, you know, whether they're regulations, whether they're legislation, whether they're uh, the, the way we do partners and leadership, or whether it's the way we put out guidance um, uh, and do awareness and education. So we're reinforcing each other, uh, as opposed to perhaps contradicting each other. I'll talk more about that later. 
Um, so the first part of, of what I wanted to expose to you is that uh, we are transforming, of course, the food guide, and you're probably aware of that out there. Uh, and uh, this is something that we've actually been up to for about four years in the sense of uh, back in 2013, 2014, we started to initiate a, a deeper dive into a, what we call an evidence review. Uh, and we have, uh, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's the best way to get the, at the evidence with the types of resources that we have. Uh, and move forward. So what we've got, we call it a cycle right now because our, our, our vision right now is that we go through on a, on a five year time frame and every five years we evaluate what, what is, what's the evidence base that's out there and, and then you make a decision on do you have to change your guidance or not because of that sort of thing. So uh, the types of evidence that we look at are three types of evidence. One has to do with what we call Canadian content. So what are people eating? What, what is the environment that we're in with respect to access to different types of foods? The second has to do with this, what we call scientific basis, and that's the relationship between different foods or d nutrients and, and health outcomes. And then how are people actually using the dietary guidance? And that can be people, consumers, are they understanding it? Are they able to access it? Are they understanding what they're supposed to be able to do? Uh, and also, uh, how are our different levels of government or health professionals, how are they incorporated into their policies and their programs going as well? So this is the type of deeper dive that we take uh, with respect to evaluate the, the evidence base. Uh, we have, uh, when, when we announced the healthy eating strategy, when the minister announced the healthy eating strategy and the revision of the food guide back in October, we also released these evidence reviews and there's both a short summary report and a, and a, and a bigger thick report that, that brings together all of that particular evidence and that's all available to everybody as well. At a very, very, very high level snapshot of the evidence review, uh, when we think about the scientific basis, uh, obviously some things have changed in the last well, the last 10 years since we put out the last food guide. Uh, and here are some examples. Now, uh, the first one here, replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated fat, and you get a decrease in cardiovascular disease. I know that there was actually a systematic review that came out yesterday that might be a little bit contradictory to that. But there, there's actually a lot of overlap with what we saw through our reviews, and I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a, in a minute here on that, in that it is what we picked up very strongly is that as in the report from yesterday, it is not about total fat and effects on, on different, uh, on disease. It is, for us, uh, what we saw was the, the linkage was a replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated fat. Uh, and uh, like yesterday, our, the evidence that we saw was that it was not about all-cause mortality, nor was it about heart attacks either. That was consistent with what we have seen as well. Uh, there are a few other observations there. Uh, much stronger evidence about uh, sugar-sweetened beverages and increased obesity, so Manny, I'm sure, loves that. Uh, and there's much stronger evidence about red and processed meats as well. Um, this was just what I was going to indicate here, that when we're looking at the evidence base for this r relationship between re for saturated fat intake and, and outcomes, uh, something I added this morning <laughs> because of yesterday there, what, uh, what we've relied on is very strong uh, reports that have come out of the World Health Organization, a couple in 19, uh, 2016, 2015, U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committees, American College of Cardiology, Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations. And all of these have found very strong, convincing evidence with respect to lowering intakes of saturated fats when replaced by unsaturated fats have been associated with a lower risk of LCD cholesterol and uh, triglycerides and also decrease in cardiovascular disease. So these are the particular outcomes where there are relationships. And like what came out yesterday, we agree that there's not all-cause mortality, nor is there uh, a linkage with respect to heart attacks. So it's not as inconsistent as you might have thought when you saw what I said and what you heard from yesterday. Uh, with respect to Canadian content, what are people eating, and, and Manny as well will like this one in the middle, foods higher in fat, sugar, and salt play a prominent role contributing about one-third of total calories. So the bottom line, of course, is because of the food environment that we're in, it, it is easy to uh, eat things that uh, we don't really think is consistent with a, a healthy pattern of eating. And again, very quickly, uh, the use of it, we know that across, across the country, uh, I think our estimates there is built into about 92 percent, 90 to 95 percent at least of all policies that provinces and territories do and, and, and incorporated into health professional groups as well. So it, it, is, it is not just a six pager, but it's actually in damn near every, every policy that's out there from the provinces and the territories and the different health professionals as well. But there are a few additional considerations and let me grab my water.
what we found when we were doing uh, doing all of this uh, uh, assembling of information, we also found that a, a real problem has to do with the, uh, the, the sort of the clutter of conflicting information that's out there. Uh, and I think for Canadians, they really have trime, trouble deciding you know, what, what, what is a reliable source. And part of it, I think, is because we as health professionals, we as different levels of government, or, or with, with different uh, chronic, uh, chronic disease NGOs, we're not always lined up with, with how we're interpreting the evidence either. So we, we sort of have to get our act together a little bit so that we are delivering consistent messages that are based on the best evidence and we're reinforcing each other instead of confusing the hell out of, of our, our poor Canadians. Um, the other things, of course, that you know, Yanni's not here because he's chairing another session right now, but he's been certainly a, a proponent of the, uh, the food guide unduly influenced by industry as well, and that's something we've heard and we are addressing very strongly with respect to how we are transforming it now. Uh, and then the other thing that's changed in the last decade is how people actually access information. Uh, you know, a, a decade ago, a six-page thing that you put up on your, on your uh, fridge was kind of, oh, that's cool, that's sort of up to date, but you know, that seems like it's almost centuries ago that that's how we access information. So we're in sort of a mobile-first environment now, and we really have to make sure that Canadians can access the information that they need wherever they are in the, in the form that they want to access it as well. So that's sort of what we've looked at. Um, as well, you know, we've scanned what other countries are doing and how they're uh, uh, approaching this. Of course, you've got Brazil that has taken one approach that's quite different than, say, what the Americans have taken, and you've got the Australians and New Zealand. So we, we've scanned through these. We've tried to figure out what are the, the best lessons from each. And basically what we've, we've really decided to do here is, is well, we're going to get rid of the, the six-pager. We're going in a completely different direction. This is not going to be a one-size-fits-all where you try and be a... Um, you try and be a good consumer piece for, uh, for, for Canadians, a simple consumer piece for Canadians. You try and be uh, a policy piece that provinces and territories can build into their different programs. And you try and also be this or more detailed, this is a pattern of eating that you should be using in institutions, whether you're planning, planning meals in hospitals or for the armed forces or whatever, that, that's where they use this so as well. So you have three very different functions that we tried to do in one six-pager. And you can't really do those three very different functions well. So where we're going is to move into what we're talking about, a Canada's Food Guide, a suite of products where we're going to create different products for different audiences, we'll say. So the, the top part of this circular diagram here, we're, we're a dietary guidance policy where we're going to take deeper dive into policy so that we, you know, right now I think the draft is up around 50 or 60 pages for part one of this particular item here, but where you actually have the time to talk about different types of beverages and sort of, and, and sort of get into the uh, in, in, into the more complicated issues. We can talk about the different fats and how different fats are actually affecting different sorts of chronic diseases as well and where there is evidence or where there's not evidence. And you know, how do you build your policy based on that? Uh, the other thing that we, um, is really the simplified messages and visuals. We've heard very strongly that the types of things that we want to use for consumers are, have to be easy to understand. So, you know, getting away from the uh, so many numbers of servings of this size of a, of a serving size and just getting uh, you know we, we, we've experimented already with a healthy eating plate and you know the basic message make half of your plate fruits and vegetables and you know, sort of my feeling that if we could get people to do that most other problems would probably fall away basically so it's trying to get figure out what's the easiest way the best way the, uh, to really get the messages across and the other side, but sort of that blue part of that diagram is, is really to respond to how do you get your information. So we are moving forward on really creating a very different access environment. Again, mobile first, where you can sort of go in and find the depth of information that you are wanting to have, uh, depending on who you are. Oh, I forgot to put my timer, so I don't know where I am here. Okay, halfway through, not bad. Um, so the other thing that's sort of in this diagram is that we've got two releases. The, what we're going to do, we say first release there, 2017-18. So you know, next February, March, what we're aiming for is to put out our first policy, part of the policy, which is sort of like the general recommendations, the sort of higher level principles, as well as the simplified, some simplified messages. And then this, a year later, we're going to take those deeper dives into doing the, the modeling and the analysis of healthy eating patterns, because we still need to have those sorts of healthy eating patterns for those health professionals who are doing the planning in different institutions or, or the one-on-one -on -one with, with their patients as well. Um, so I basically said this in terms of the, the policy report, two parts, the general 
general guidance on healthy eating, uh, and then the second part being about the healthy eating patterns. You know, part of the reason that this is being delayed in terms of the uh, healthy eating patterns is because we don't have the, the latest consumption data, which was collected by Stats Canada in 2015. It's going to be another month or so before we get that, and so we can actually do the deeper dive into, into the modeling. Um, the, the part one, then, the way we've got uh, our draft set up right now is we have a number of, of guide, what we call guiding principles. So you can see this is sort of by chapters, I guess you'll say, or by guiding principle. So these are overarching positions on healthy eating, and, and sort of what we're looking at right now is that um, you know, the first guiding principle has to do with what are the components of a healthy diet sort of thing, and where, where you're really pushing people towards, you know, lots of, lots of variety of different types of foods and fruits and vegetables, et cetera, there. The, the second guiding principle has, it's a bit more focused on the types of things that you should be limiting uh, or avoiding. And, and, you know, Manny's talked about certain aspects of things that should be limited and avoided as well, and you'll find those sorts of things in there as well. And then the, um, the third sort of guiding principle, we're sort of focusing around, we'll call it food skills or food literacy or enjoyment of eating, a, a bit sort of trying to take the lessons of, of someone like, uh, like Brazil, what they brought into in terms of it, it's sort of not just what you're eating, but it's sort of how you're eating and how do you actually develop the types of skills as well to be able to do that. That's what we're trying to build into the, the, the third guiding principle. So that's sort of what we're, we're thinking of for that part one of the dietary guidance. Uh, as well, there are, you know, we're going to have practice considerations in there, looking at you know, the, the equity lens, determinants of health, cultural diversity, and, and also uh, sort of going down that line, you know, what's the environmental impact of different sorts of, uh, of our dietary guidance as well. So that's, that's where we're going for right now. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit later about, yeah, we're go we'll be going up for consultation in just over a month on that, so you all have opportunities to feed into that. I mentioned, of course, our, our health eating patterns modeling here. So um, basically, we're waiting for that statistical analysis of food surveillance data. We are thinking possibly, uh, I think it has an S, doesn't it, on health eating patterns there, uh, and sort of taking that deeper dive and think, you know, there are different ways to eat healthy. So we're trying to do the, to look at that as well so that people will be able to sort of find themselves a bit more in that as well, and you have different sorts of options, whether, I mean, the, the easiest way to, you know, right off the bat is, you know, basically a, omnivorous pattern and then one that's more vegetarian focused as well and whether you can adapt that to more vegan or something like that. So those are the types of things that we're, we're looking at and, and we can go further from there as well. Um, we are, are certain, even though we have not, uh, don't have the data yet, we've already have quite an international uh, advisory committee working with us on that to, to sort of develop the right type of methodology to do that. Uh, we are well underway on that particular aspect as well. With respect to the tools and resources for consumers, for Canadians, um, basically, I guess the third point there is that we're trying to really think about more holistic health eating advice, such as the promoting food skills. And again, in line with um, you know, a lot of what you got from the Brazilians as well, in terms of it, it's about how you're doing your eating as well, that we really have to be, have to be there as well. And it's this sort of integration of, of tips and recommendations so it can actually make it real for getting you there. Uh, again, we've already talked about this, the idea is to have more simplified tools to use a variety of different media types to get there as well. Five more minutes. And, um, and a very important aspect of all of this, and it flips back to where we started saying that the problem was the, the, the information that's different depending on where it's coming from, is we're working very closely with quite a large group of health stakeholders in the provinces and territories to, to really get their advice, and the idea is that we actually come up with a policy that will be used by different health professional organizations, by different uh, health NGOs, by the provinces and territories, so that we'll, because we're developing it along in a more of a partnered way uh, and meeting with them all the time and trying to find out you know, what their needs are, that it will be easy to sort of evolve into the basis, I will say, of what their dietary guidance is as well, so there'll be that consistency. Now, for some, we'll say, different disease disease groups, you have to have 
have modified perhaps some of the messages, but the base should be the very same. And, and that's sort of the approach that we're trying to go. So this, through what we're calling the multiplier effect, there'll be this consistency for Canadians. It's not just going to be what they hear from me at Health Canada. This should be reinforced by what you know, the dietitians of Canada are saying, the Canadian, uh, the, the Children's Obesity Foundation is saying, or what Heart and Stroke is saying as well. So again, we're, we're, sort of, we're backing each other up with respect to moving people towards more, more healthy eating. Um, engagement, uh, this is the point, we are in full, full throttle here with respect to our consultations. Uh, so we have open public consultations and these little icons here talk about the different groups. The first one on the top is what we're doing with ordinary Canadians, the provinces and territories, NGOs, and on the bottom the shopping cart is to represent industry there. Uh, we're also doing public opinion research, usability testing, state, uh, online discussion forums, expert advice. So one thing you will notice for my dear friend Yanni is that the only time you see anything to do with industry is during these public open consultations. We are not sort of meeting with them uh, and, and bringing them in. As a matter of fact, I'm not meeting with them at all for this two year time. No one in my office or myself for this next two years until we have actually come out with the new policies and stuff. We're not even meeting with industry or exchanging letters with industry basically. So that, that's the type of commitment we're making to, to make sure that we deal with that perception of how we get controlled by industry. So I, I think we're getting, uh, one, I guess one other thing that, that has come up both in the Senate report and from others is the, uh, is, is, is had to do really with the type of committee and the influence of industry on the committee. Well, we've actually decided not to have a set committee. We worked with CIHR to, to scan, you know, who are the experts in Canada and abroad with respect to a, a whole wide range of different um, uh, areas of competence with respect to nutrition. So we've got a pool of about 200 experts that we've identified. Uh, selection criteria there, and once again, in the middle, you'll see there's no direct or indirect interest or affiliation with industry with those researchers. That's pretty hard these days, actually, to find people who aren't, but uh, that's something we're committed to doing as well. So when we have a topic where we have to have input, we don't just have the same standing group of 12 people. We'll get 12 people who actually have expertise on that particular topic, and we'll deal with that, and then we'll move on to a different topic as well. So it's using the best people at the right time to get the best type of, of uh, advice. So we are coming up to the end here, <laughs> and so where we are here, uh, we have done the, the first public consultation was back in the, in the fall. Um, we're developing uh, this draft of the dietary guidance policy and our recommendations and our related resources. In um, beginning of June, we're, we're going for, there'll be the, the spring public consultation that will really be about these, these general policy elements, and so you, we hope that you guys will be involved in that release the first wave of this in um, you know, winter of 2017-18, and then, then the, the, whole, the whole thing in the end uh, in about two years from now, we'll say. So once again, just to reinforce this, it's not about rejigging a six-pager, it's actually about producing a whole new suite of different types of products that are aimed at the different audiences that you want to have and making them accessible in, a, in an easy way so you can go down and find the level of information that you're wanting. And if you want to get, stay on top, register yourself and we'll give you updates on where we're, we're going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Hutchison. So it is now my pleasure to invite our final speaker of the morning, uh, Jan Lobodo. Since 2012, Dr. Jan Lobodo has been a project manager at the Evaluation Platform on Obesity Prevention, EPOP, set up by Laval University and the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. So please welcome Dr. Lobodo. Yeah. So thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, as it had been mentioned, just to let you know that I, am, I work and I'm PhD student actually at the Evaluation Platform on Obesity Prevention uh, whose activities are funded by Laval University, uh, thanks to a development grant from the Fondation Lucie and André Chagnon. And also that the topic of the review I will present today has been the subject of a book published uh, last year. Thank you. And no uh, commercial support to disclose. So uh, I'm pleased today to uh, talk about sugar sweetened beverage taxation uh, in Canada, also on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Marie-Claude Paquette and uh, Philippe de Waals, a uh, mini review based on international uh, evidence as well as in the, the Canadian context. 
So a few words of history, just to remind that the concept of health-related food tax uh, emerged in the 1990s in the United States in a period of rapid increase of chronic social disease with a primary uh, purpose uh, that was to, um, to raise funds uh, in order to, uh, to uh, support health promotion activities while eventually discouraging uh, consumption. And little by little, there has, there has been a, a focus on, uh, on sugar-sweetened beverages, particularly because of their low nutritive value and uh, increasing health concerns related to overconsumption, particularly in, uh, in youth. And actually, there have been many proposals for uh, years to uh, tax sugar-sweetened beverages, but since 2010, there have been increasing adoption of sugar-sweetened beverage taxation related to health uh, reasons across the, the world, although uh, it remains debated in many places as well, including in, uh, in Canada. Actually, uh, in Canada, sales tax uh, are already applied on SSBs as many other uh, goods and services at federal level and in several provinces uh, at, at well, uh, as well, even if it's not for health reasons. So what, what we are talking about here would be an additional tax, for instance, according to the frequent, uh, frequently made hypothesis, uh, one cent per ounce additional excess tax, that if it is fully shifted to price, on this uh, example of bill, for instance, that would represent an extra uh, 17 cents. So to review evidence about uh, uh, the relevancy to tax sugar sweetened beverage taxation, we have, uh, uh, we have used the conceptual framework from the Institute of uh, Medicine, lead the lead framework for locate, evaluate, assess evidence and inform decisions, which actually, to make it short, uh, raised three kinds of uh, uh, of themes or questions, which is to know why should we do something about the, uh, the problem at stake, what are the potential impact of solutions that are under consideration, and how far these solutions would be applicable in a particular uh, context. So we have conducted a realist type of literature review with the uh, importance given to context and uh, interdisciplinary interpredici perspective. So uh, through uh, a keyword-based documentary research and snowball research approach and a synthesis uh, in a thematic, cumulative, and dynamic way. Uh, I, I have added references mm -hmm. for the mini-review of today uh, since it has been published. And um, this led us to propose a multidimensional perspective subdivided into uh, 14 points that I will, uh, I will talk about now. So first, considering uh, uh, the prevention of uh, non-communicable disease, of course, it should be reminded that it's a complex issue and uh, uh, that, of course, uh, many factors have to be, uh, have to be tackled. Uh, however, tackling many factors at the same time does not preclude focusing on particular ones. And indeed, there, in, uh, there is increasing uh, uh, evidence uh, associating a uh, high level of consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages with uh, several health issues that it has been reminded by, um, by uh, Manuel Arango uh, uh, earlier today, uh, including the fact that it has been related to weight gain, diabetes, and, uh, and dental caries, and emerging evidence on all the health issues uh, uh, as, as well. So which is quite particularly unusual for a single food uh, category. And it uh, should also be mentioned that sugar-sweetened beverages have been uh, particularly subject to intense marketing. And this includes um, uh, affordability, as it has been said also earlier today. And just to illustrate this, this, this point of, uh, of affordability, this graph from colleagues at the Institut National de, de Santé Publique du Québec, which uh, actually shows that um, uh, looking at trends in average purchase price per liter of non-alcoholic beverages in Quebec supermarkets between 2010 and 2014, uh, particularly affordable uh, prices for soft drink and fruit drinks in comparison, for instance, to uh, milk. So concurrently, um, there has been a high level of consumption of SSBs in the Canadian population. And here, this graph from Statistics Canada and uh, CCHS data 2004 indicates in the black bars the percentage of daily calories deriv derived from sweetened drinks, and which actually shows that it can be up to 7 to 8 percent of daily calories in adolescence, which is close to the 10 percent uh, um, uh, maximum daily, uh, uh, daily calories uh, from free sugars recommended by World Health Organization, even without considering other sources of free, uh, of free sugars. 
So um, CCHS data collected in 2015 will enable to update this, uh, these figures in the, coming, uh, in the coming months. When coming to potential solutions, uh, it has been said also several times uh, earlier in this session, but uh, of course it's important to consider that uh, uh, taxation should not be considered as a silver uh, bullet and that a, comp a comprehensive and multifaceted strategy is required. And it's the same for a lot of eating behaviors, but uh, SSB consumption, frequent SSB consumption has also been correlated to many factors, visits visit at individual level, at family level, uh, among peers, and also uh, changes in the uh, environment uh, that are favorable to uh, SSB, um, SSB taxation. So uh, this, is, um, this is why, of course, taxation should not be considered as the solution, but rather than a potentially interesting instrument among, uh, among, many, uh, among many others. When considering the rationale about uh, SSB taxation, uh, it also implied ethical considerations. And indeed, much of the debate on the relevancy of SSB taxation uh, has been about ethical consideration, for instance, about consumers' autonomy. Some arguing that uh, education and information should be preferred rather than others, uh, particularly in the public health arena, consider that uh, uh, changes should also be made in the environment to make the uh, healthier uh, options, the, the healthier choice, the, 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 the easier choice. And uh, to make the health such as the easy choice, taxation could be part of, uh, of the strategy, uh, uh, but uh, having also other, uh, other options and, and uh, strategies, uh, for instance, making healthy options more affordable. Then when, uh, when discussing the rationale about SSB taxation, it seems very important actually to uh, indicate what would be the taxation logic. Uh, actually, framing of SSB taxation is essential because it defines what, uh, what are the potential uh, uh, effects that could be expected and that should be expected. And actually, in the literature, there are three logics that emerge when discussing SSB taxation. Um, maybe the, the more intuitive one is the uh, taxing SSB as a way to raise price, decrease consumption, and eventually uh, positively impacting uh, health outcomes. Another one, uh, and, and this, this can be also can raise equity concerns and uh, can be related to undesirable effect. A second logic, which would be to uh, uh, tax SSB as a way to, ra to raise revenue that could, be, uh, uh, could contribute to uh, cover healthcare costs or contribute to fund health promotion activities or programs that are aimed to reduce health inequalities in nutrition. And another one that, uh, uh, another logic that would be taxing SSB as a way to send the signal possibly uh, towards manufacturers in order to accelerate their reformulation efforts toward a, a healthier portfolio. So let's have a look at the, the evidence on these different uh, components. The first question may be first that uh, to know to what extent would SSB tax would actually be shifted onto prices. We could imagine that uh, manufacturers and retailers could absorb the cost of the tax and not, rely, uh, not, not actually pass on uh, onto uh, SSB price. Um, on, this, uh, on this aspect, uh, natural experiments are out of Canada, of course, uh, suggest that uh, probable price increase in a short to medium term uh, uh, could, uh, could translate, uh, could be a result of SSB taxation. So it, it is difficult to disentangle precisely tax effect from other uh, influences. For instance, in uh, France and, uh, and Mexico, it is considered uh, uh, within the evidence that the tax has been fully shifted to price. In some cases, it has been maybe over shifted. But in other places, such as in Berkeley, California, uh, the price increase as a result of the tax uh, is considered within two uh, research recently published to be half what was uh, actually expected. Another question would be, provided the tax does generate a price, a price hike, would be to know if actually it uh, translates into lower SSB uh, consumption. Uh, and uh, on, this, uh, on this question, there is actually a lot of research indicating that in normal, unusual market condition, Without, uh, any, uh, without any additional tax, consumers are usually price, uh, SSB consumers are usually price sensitive, which, which makes that when price augment, uh, increase in normal ma market condition, uh, uh, it is accompanied by lower uh, uh, consumption. And this is what we call price elasticity of demand. Uh, and based on the basis of this uh, 
good price elasticity of demand, uh, encouraging simulation studies uh, generally predict uh, positive health outcomes following SSV taxation. And uh, Manuel Arango uh, quoted uh, the, the only study that we have had to date in Canada. There are a lot of studies of this kind in other, in other countries, but one has been performed by, by colleagues of the, uh, of the University of Waterloo uh, this year and uh, showing uh, this kind of uh, encouraging simulation. But as to know if that translates into positive results in the real world, we have to look as well on uh, natural experiments out of Canada. And there are today two uh, evaluations um, of positive uh, evaluations uh, uh, to date of SSB taxation in uh, Mexico first, where a 10% tax on SSB uh, has been implemented since the 1st of January 2014. And according to modelization by Cochero and colleagues, two years post-implementation, it appears that uh, the tax has been accompanied by an average 7.6% decrease in the purchase of taxed beverages uh, in comparison to a situation where no tax would have been implemented. A few days ago, uh, another a study has been published about the Berkeley uh, case, uh, and uh, Silver and colleagues uh, have uh, conducted a modelization uh, one year post-implementation that indicates that the taxation in Berkeley uh, actually led to a 9.6% decrease in sales of tax beverages in comparison to a situation where no tax would have been implemented. So these are uh, observational uh, studies. So the design uh, preclude making uh, firm demonstration of cost-to-effect relationship, but still it is uh, encouraging for other jurisdiction. So um, this is uh, why SSV taxation may lead to actually, actually to a probable modest decrease in consumption in short to medium term, provided the tax rate is significant. As regards the impact on weight and health, uh, it remains much more uh, uh, uncertain. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, taxation may not be uh, a magic bullet, so as a result, uh, we talk about a weak signal to, no to noise ratio. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons for this are uh, concerns in terms of substitution effects. Substitution effects are actually the risks that lower SSB consumption be replaced by higher consumption of other caloric drink, uh, drinks or, uh, or, uh, or foods. In this regard, there are few, um, there are few uh, evaluation in uh, the real world of what happened in terms of substitution effects, but once again, preliminary evidence from Mexico and Berkeley tends to indicate that while SSB purchases have decreased, it has been replaced by higher uh, consumption or purchase of untaxed beverages and particularly bottled water. So this should be confirmed on the longer term, but is encouraging. Another important concern when talking about SSV taxation is the, uh, the fact that uh, it would likely be a regressive tax, uh, considering that uh, it may uh, impose a larger financial burden of a uh, household with lower income, uh, especially since, uh, in average, it has been shown that uh, uh, households with, with lower income tend to uh, consume uh, higher uh, amount of SSBs. So on this uh, aspect, um, of course, it could be considered that in most consumers, the amount of the tax would not be very elevated, but still it can be elevated in, uh, in some households. And another consideration is to look at the price elasticity of demand uh, across uh, income groups. It actually shows that uh, the uh, price sensitivity of lower income households would not be different from uh, those of other income groups but yet uh, this has to be uh, confirmed in, in practice. And preliminary evidence from Mexico and Berkeley also indicate that there has been good uh, response from uh, lower income uh, consumers to the tax. Another important point would be to know what would be uh, the use of the revenues from uh, taxation and whether uh, they could be earmarked to health promotion or the reduction of uh, health inequalities uh, and eventually to make healthier options more affordable. So this is also an important uh, point to discuss when talking about the, uh, the regressive aspect of the tax. As regards uh, undesirable effects on employment, competitiveness, this is some, sometimes quoted as an undesirable potential effect and decision makers usually weigh the potential benefits of SSB taxation against uh, potential risk for uh, the economy. Um, the literature uh, is not very, um, uh, is limited so far on these aspects. Uh, there are observational studies and anecdotal evidence and also simulations 
that indicate that this, has this, um, uh, this impact, this negative impact, could be limited, particularly if the tax scope is narrow. If the objective of the tax is also to raise fiscal revenues, uh, examples from and lessons from other jurisdictions like Mexico, Berkeley, France, and others uh, have shown that it can be a realist objective and, and quite rapidly achievable. But again come, uh, comes back the question of what would be done with these revenues and whether or not it would be earmarked for health promotion or the reduction of uh, health inequalities in nutrition and, uh, and health. And we know that it increases also the acceptability of taxation if there is this earmarking. As regards signal effects, particularly towards manufacturers, there is little evidence to date. However, promising one from a simulation study uh, published at the beginning of the year that indicates that it could actually encourage manufacturers to accelerate their reformulation efforts, especially if there are thresholds of taxation above and, uh, and below uh, uh, a certain uh, amount of grams of sugar per, uh, per liter. Now, besides uh, rational and potential effects uh, of SSB taxation comes the, the, the question of the applicability of SSB taxation in a given jurisdiction. And this may, may include acceptability concerns and feasibility concerns, which all together can actually impact decision making and lead or not to the adoption of sugar sweetened beverage taxation in combination or not with other uh, initiatives with, uh, which I said at the beginning was very important uh, as part of a multifaceted strategy. On this aspect, as regards feasibility of SSB taxation in Canada, usually in the literature, excess taxation is uh, more recommended. Excess taxation is a tax uh, applied at the manufacturer or distributor level. And it is more recommended, there are many reasons, but one particular reason is that there is uh, more likelihood of having a price hike uh, on SSBs uh, on the shelves in the store for the consumers, at least in Canada and the US, rather than sales tax are only uh, visible and salient at, at, the, at the checkout. So there would be more uh, likelihood uh, to impact purchasing behavior. However, in Canada, there is, um, it's possible to, uh, it, it seems to be likely feasible to have an excess tax, but at federal level only. Whereas uh, at provincial or territorial level, there may be uh, more possibility for a special tax using the models of the tobacco and alcohol uh, tax, uh, special tax uh, models. There would be also other uh, issues about feasibility as regards the fiscal nomenclature, because in Canada, carbonated beverages are all considered together so far, whatever their content or com uh, of sugar or composition. So that would be another uh, challenge to be uh, addressed anyways. About the uh, acceptability um, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, it's mixed in the public and among stakeholders. And looking at lessons from abroad, actually, uh, there, are there are some conditions that may favor or, dis or disfavor SSB tax taxation adoption. Just to quote some of them, it seems that the severity of NCDs and obesity issues and the level of uh, uh, SSB consumption appeared to be uh, important in some cases, in Mexico, for instance. The economic situation, more or less favorable to taxation, uh, also appears to be uh, essential in some cases. Um, budgetary deficit or budgetary constraints have appeared in some cases to uh, favor uh, uh, SSB taxation on the agenda in some, in some jurisdiction. The cooperation between public health and finance authorities also appear to be very important as uh, at the end of the day, finance authorities are in charge of designing and administrating the tax. So uh, this appeared to be uh, important in several cases. And actually, in some jurisdictions, the public health rationale of the tax has been minimized uh, uh, in order to favor adoption. This has been the case, uh, for instance, recently in, uh, in Philadelphia. Political leadership has also shown to be important. This is at executive level. For instance, the president of Mexico and uh, the mayor of Philadelphia was very committed to supporting SSB taxation. It, uh, it can also be the case in the legislative arena, uh, where a lot, of, a lot takes place there. Um, uh, for instance, in the French National Assembly or the Mexican uh, Senate, it appears to be very important. It's well known that opposition from economic actors and from groups uh, have uh, played an important role to, uh, pr to um, prevent SSB taxation proposal to be adopted in the last years. However, uh, growing NGO advocacy and communication efforts, particularly when financially supported by philanthropic organizations, has shown to be, um, uh, to be successful. As I said several times, the question of what could be uh, done with the revenue of the tax is the central one. 
Um, uh, however, uh, here marking revenues of the tax to special causes may raise feasibility concerns. Local evidence as regards effectiveness of taxation also appeared to be important in several cases, and international support, particularly from WHO, has been quoted to be important in some cases. And so to conclude, um, evaluation also appears to be uh, an important aspect, as uh, I have quoted several uncertainties in this presentation. So evaluation of SSV taxation appears to be essential to develop knowledge, to measure progress in cases where it has been implemented, and eventually to take corrective action. So to conclude, it's, uh, this mini review, of course, is just a starting point for discussion. It's, uh, it shows that it's relevant to prevent SSB consumption in Canada uh, thanks to a multifaceted health promotion strategy within, within which taxation could be part of. But it's important to clarify the logics. It's important also to uh, possibly have uh, price elasticity estimates of SSB demand in Canada to address potential regressive and uh, undesirable effects and to discuss tax design considerations and evaluation, dep depending on what we saw in other jurisdictions, appears to be uh, particularly important to be planned in advance. And the applica applicability consideration, I've just mentioned a few at the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Perfect, that's the end of the uh, presentation. Let's hear it again for our speakers this morning. And, of course, now we have a break until 10, so please uh, go out, enjoy the nutrition, check out the posters and the exhibitors, and uh, we'll see you all in some of the future sessions. Thanks.